Welcome back to the Commanders Declassified Podcast. Yes, I'm back. It is LE. I'm back on the podcast. Shout out to the fellas for holding it down last week. Uh, Eric, what's going on, man? It was hard holding it down, but we managed. Welcome back. I appreciate you. Is there big shoes to fill over there? You know what? They might be a size 11. Who knows? But <laughs> Mike from Southwest. Mike, how's it going? What's happening, y'all? I wear I I have the biggest feet. I have a size 18. So I'm I'm what? good at filling in people's shoes. I oh. actually need more space to fill in, if you know what see I'm this, saying. You see this hat? I'm gonna send it to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he believes in Bigfoot. And uh, shout out to Brian, too, man. He's over there um, in Columbia getting some work done with, the, you know, those doctors out there that you can only get when you go that way. So we hope everything goes well with his his work. And uh, we'll see him back here soon. A lot is going on in Commander's Land, and we are going to talk about it to you tonight. But first, make sure you are subscribed on YouTube, audio, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google. Heck, we might even be on a typewriter somewhere near you. You never know. We are everywhere. Make sure you get locked in. Let's jump right into it, fellas. We're going to start with the most recent thing. Ron Rivera comes out and says that players have come to him about Eric Bieniemy's coaching style. Eric, is this a big deal? Everything's a big deal in training camp. Um Look, I don't know if it's a big deal or not. I watched uh, Bienemy's press conference today, and he he's very, very well spoken, very assertive. But you can totally tell that he has his opinions, and he's going to be. It's difficult to change his opinions. Uh, I think you and I have talked about this before, Ellie, where it's you know hard coaching works to a point, and it, people begin to tune you out after a period of time. I think it's way too early for that. I don't think we're we're at that point yet, but there is going to be some backlash because it's very different from the type of coaching they've had previously. So. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm not making a huge deal out of it at this point, but we'll have to we'll have to keep an eye on it to see if if his act really wears thin. I just, you know, he's his. I think that his personality and his his kind of hard edge, his abrasive kind of personality, is really the thing that has held him back from getting a head coaching job more than anything. Because I mean, just watching him today in that press conference, the way he talks to just reporters. And it just, it doesn't seem like he changes his tone or demeanor around anyone. And if he's talking to a billionaire with no filter, I can't see those interviews going well. Um, and I really think that that's a, that's a big part of it. Uh, I think that, you know, it's something that bears watching. Uh, I think Eric Bieniemy may have a little bit of growing to do because you can't just yell at people all the time and expect to get positive results. I think at this point, after what they've been through, the results – will improve because of that it just it, it's a matter of time before it wears thin but yeah it, it bears watching i'm not making a huge deal out of it yet uh i think he did really well in his press conference kind of setting minds at ease he had a, he had a great press conference today if you guys haven't watched it yet go watch it it was really good nsfw though literally no filter on that guy <laughs> <laughs> your scale of concern eric uh we'll call it the vietnami meter in terms of this zero to ten where, where are you at um, and like a two, I'm not, I'm really not concerned about it at all. He's going to rub his personality is, is what it is. It's been said before. He's going to rub people the wrong way. It's not a huge deal to me at this point. I think it will grow in the future because a, again, if he continues to coach guys that hard after he's been with them for a while, it could be, I think he's got a year or two of a, of a grace period on that. I'm not concerned about it at all right now. Yeah. I think, uh, the fact that though this is a thing we are talking about is a problem for me because we finally got the opportunity to just focus on football and here we go. And uh, so Mike, Ron Rivera said this out loud and nobody, nobody made him do it. Is that a problem that Ron Rivera is putting this out there? Definitely, definitely. And I know some people are trying to defend them and like i understand but at the end of the day you've been in the city this is your fourth season in this city you know how they like to take stuff and twist it even if it's the most honest genuine um thing they're going to find a way to twist it so if you give them something juicy like this you see what happened the, not only did the local media sink their teeth into it this got all the way to the national media I saw Booger McFarlane on ESPN talking about this. 
So it was a very eventful day that could have been 100% avoided if Rivera just answered that question much better than he did. I don't know how much worse he could have answered that question. <laughs> Absolutely. And the thing is, like, you know that this perception is out there about Eric B. Enemy, right? And, you know, Shady McCoy said it. You know that there was a little bit of an icy relationship with Patrick Mahomes. The quarterback documentary didn't help that whatsoever, right? Because there was zero interaction between these two. As a head coach and a leader of this individual, you have to protect his future too. Ron Rivera did not protect Eric Bannemi's future by putting that information out there. And I think that's where he failed in this situation. So I'm with you, Eric. Not a big deal that it's going on because our players are used to club med at training camp, right? And um, we don't really have a justification for taking it easy in camp. But the real failure here was on the head coach even putting this out in the limelight. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely no need for that. Yeah, was that an un that was an unprompted statement? He wasn't asked about it. He just came out and said it because I think I missed that part. Somebody did ask about know. somebody. I, I think it was um, I think it was um, Nikki Giovala who asked him about the coaching style because they said, I mean, he mentioned during um, mini camp that uh, it's going to be intense and all this other stuff. So she was just basically asking how players had taken to that coaching style. He volunteered the information the players coming to his office talking about the enemy. And I'm like, what? I didn't even, you didn't have to say that. You could have just said it's, um, it's a work in progress or the players are taking its um, will to it. There may be some that um, had to get on board, but now everybody's good to go. But nah, he went straight nuclear. I like. Well, that. I wouldn't say nuclear, yeah, but he, maybe Ron's he, trying to protect his own job. He feels that he he feels being enemy breathing down his neck. He knows he's on a short leash. He's going to do it. No, I thought the most okay. interesting part was when he compared him to kind of Jack Del Rio, and he was like, "Well, Jack has been a head coach, and he kind of knows how to step back and manage personalities," which I agree with 100. Like, I think that is a, a huge part of being a head coach, managing personalities like that, and that's definitely or a more than likely something that would be enemy would need to work on. But yeah, putting that out there, comparing him to another coach, like, oh, all right, we'll see how that goes. But and I can see I'm at a two right now. I can see if this wasn't something he's done before, but. It's been plenty of times that he said something that he just should not have said, like last year after the Browns game, saying that he didn't know we were we could be eliminated from the playoffs. Even if that was a joke or if he was being sarcastic, like some some jokes just aren't worth it, especially after that game where you start wince and everything was just horrible. That's not the time to joke and be sarcastic. Yeah. He is captain. Put your foot in your mouth for sure. So, um, <laughs> all right, Eric, Jacoby Brissett this week got some reps with the ones. There was some conversation that Sam Howell's been up and down. So maybe this is what it was. It really seemed to boil down to them just wanting to get him some work with the first team offense. If you're Sam Howell, are you at all concerned about this? No, you, you have to get your backup quarterback some reps every once in a while. Sam, I, mean, I don't see any reason why. Sam should be worried about this. He's up and down. He's in training camp. It's his first year in the offense. He's a second-year quarterback who's got one career start. He's going to be up and down. He's going to have struggles. I don't think his job's in any jeopardy. I don't think his job is in any jeopardy for the better part of this season unless he is completely incompetent. I mean, even if he plays like Taylor Heineke last year, I think his job is probably, <laughs> is probably secure just because, you know, you're just, you know, I always consider Sam Howell to be like that lottery ticket where like you're probably not going to hit, but you never know until you until you have it. So there's always that little bit of hope. Whereas Brissett, like, you know, exactly you're punting on the season. If Brissett's your week one starter, you're going you're going to be a mid tier team. So, man, roll the dice on how let it roll. I mean, Rivera's got to save his job this year and rolling with Brissett for an extended period of time is more than likely not going to be enough to save his job. So, uh, no, I don't think Sam has anything to worry about. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think the only person Brissett would even possibly benefit is the enemy if he plays well, right? Yeah. Because Sam Howell is on Ron Rivera, period. The enemy has nothing to do with that if Sam Howell doesn't work out. If the enemy, if Howell does work out, that's all on Eric, the enemy, right? So it's kind of a can't lose situation in terms of quarterback play for the enemy. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I like you guys know. I I like. 
first round picks as quarterbacks, because generally speaking, in the NFL, that's where your success comes from. However, the upside for Brissett is exactly what you said. It's, you know, you're, you're capping your season at a certain point, unless your defense is in fact elite. So I don't think Rivera is there yet, but what I will say is I don't think there will be any hesitation if there's early struggles from how to, to give um, how the hook and bring in uh Brissett at some point or you know within the first quarter of the season i'm not i don't think they're past that um you can't go back though if you do that like you're making your bed with percent at that point you cannot go back to howl if you yank him in the first quarter of the season so i think true, he's got to be true. awful for that he's got to be just dreadful for that to happen like i don't think i don't think mid-tier quarterback play is gonna is gonna is gonna get him yanked i think he's got to be just a trip like he's got to be like carson Wentz against cleveland bad he's got to be horrible to get pulled that early in the season and I don't think he will I be. Think I think he'll, he'll be. I think he'll be up and down. He'll be okay, and I think he's going to play for the better part of the season, as long as he's healthy. To me, it's a combination of wins and play. I don't think he has to be awful. I think he just has to not be particularly good, or he's just really, really average, right? And the team is like one and four, like at the end of the first five games of the season. I think he gets the hook. I think if if the team is two and two. Um, or, you know, two and three, maybe three and two or something like that. And he's just average. He keeps playing. But I, I just – there's something about Rivera that he cannot just help himself with veteran quarterbacks. You know what I'm saying? At some point, he likes the safe choice. And I think he, you know, he could get tempted to do that. Not saying I want that or I know that's going to happen. I'm just saying if you follow the pattern of, of Rivera, he kind of always does this. And every season that we've had with him as head coach, there have been multiple quarterback changes. So it would definitely be a yeah. departure from our norm if we stay with one the whole season. So well, if I'm just gonna say I will go on record for this. If Brissett, if Brissett replaces Howell at any point this season, Ron's a dead man walking. He's done. Maybe. He's his his career here is done. He's not coming back <laughs> next year because I don't I mean he's got a very low shot of coming back next year anyway. Like I would fire him if he didn't make it to the NFC championship this year. I've seen enough out of him. Like that's my bar for him to stick around. Anything less than that, find somebody else. That's just that's me. That's a bro. high bar. For I don't care, that man. Hasn't been there in thirty-two years or something like no. that. That's where he's got. I mean, I mean, what he sneaks into the playoffs again, maybe gets a win. You know, he you know he sneaks a wild card win. Like I'm not interested in that. Give me the NFC championship yeah. game. If we can get a dominant season, even if it's a ten-win season, well, but those ten year. wins. We're like <laughs> he kind of dominant. Like we're gonna the be ten wins average. were like the most of them came towards the end of the season. You get in the playoffs as like a six seed or something. You beat the five or four seed in the tournament or whatever, and you lose to the eventual Super Bowl champion or something like that. But a, a NFC championship that's that's high. You sound like um, Brian at the. Um, no, I'm not guaranteeing we're getting. That's the difference between me and Brian. I'm not saying we're getting. Said, it. I'm saying if we don't get there, I don't want Ron to come back. That's what I'm saying. He said the floor was um, ten wins. I think. <laughs> like wow. Uh, yeah. Bless thing, his heart. The thing is, it's about accountability, though. To Eric's point, like if Ron were just the head coach, okay, right? But he's the whole show here, and he's been that for four years, right? So. At some point, you got to see the results, and we haven't seen those effectively yet. All right, Mike, offensive line issues are a very real thing. People said, no, it doesn't matter because the pads aren't on. The pads are on, and they're still getting a body rocked in in camp. So what's going on with our offensive line? Is this going to be an issue throughout the entire season? So I I haven't listened to the whole thing, but um, Logan Paulson – uh, was going to take command, and he mentioned how the offensive line has looked better since Sadiq Charles was injured. Chris Paul's been starting at um, guard, and the offensive line just seems to look better. I, personally speaking, am still concerned because they didn't address it the way it should have been addressed this offseason. However, they may have fluked themselves into a decent situation with the addition of the enemy who can, you know, hide some of the problems on the offensive line better than last year's coordinator. I'm not even going to say his name. But, um, yeah, I, I on a scale of 1 to 10, 
I'm an even five. I'm an even five. I think they may play well, but it's a strong chance that they can look as bad as last season. Yeah. And it, and it really depends on who we play. And I think, unfortunately, we play a lot of really ferocious defensive lines this year. <clears throat> so their opportunity to get a lot of those, like, gimme games is going to be out the window early. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, I, I have a high level of concern about the offensive line. You don't get more physical as the season goes on, right? Um, right. You get more cohesive. You can get, you know, better in sort of your scheme, understanding, and discipline, but you don't get more physical. So that's to me, is going to be a prevailing issue throughout the season. Uh, and so, like, you know, generally, I say this all the time, but like with training camp, you're looking for patterns, right? What, what are patterns the teams are showing in camp? <clears throat> One of those is the offensive line, especially on the interior, is getting is very weak. Um, our tackles can are decent to good, but we're having issues on the inside. And, uh, you know, with Philly's defensive line, that is very problematic. With Dallas's defensive line, that is extremely problematic. So, and all of that helps dictate what we're going to get out of the quarterback position. So this may be a thing that is going to cause our season to spiral if we don't get this short up. You know, I'll add this part. Um, and the enemy even said something about it in his press conference. I understand that they're going up against arguably a top three defensive line in the league uh, with the commanders, Payne Allen, you know, sweat chase. I understand that part. However, you can't get dominated every single day. And I don't think they have. I think they may have done well some days. But like you're saying, um, like you said, the pattern has been the dom, the defensive line has dominated them. So the question we're going to have to have as a fan base is, did the offensive line look bad in the training camp because they were going up against an elite D-line? Or if they're really that bad? We'll know middle, early. Right? right. We'll know early because we play the Cardinals, who I'm going to be honest with you. I can't name a single person on their defense outside of um, that dude from Clemson. Simmons, I think his name is. The, um, Simeon Rice. That was like, no, was like <laughs> no, no, I said it's Simmons. <laughs> Isaiah Simmons the, um, yeah. yeah, Isaiah Simmons. So, like, that's a game the offensive line has to at least play well in. Because if they look trash versus the Cardinals and you got the Broncos and Bills coming up next, that's not a good thing. And we could easily start off 0-3 if the offensive line isn't on their P's and Q's. Yeah. And if we lose that first game of the season, pack the whole season up because we are done. Um, So we've also got reports that the running game is struggling in camp to some degree. Um, I think that's probably largely attributed to the offensive line, somewhat attributed to the lack of just dynamic playmakers we have in the backfield. Eric, are you concerned about the run game at this point? And uh, I think, uh, you know, we don't really get a lot of reports about the running backs and how BNM is using them, what he's doing with them, et cetera, et cetera. I, I heard this point from someone. I want to give credit to it, but I can't really remember where it was. But um, it might have been Doc Walker. It could have been somebody else. And forgive me. But they said, if you're looking for a lot of running back involvement, then this isn't the offense for you, like as a fan, because this ain't what it's going to be. It's going to be a lot of passing, 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 and then opportunistic running. But are you at all concerned about some of the early reports about struggles in the run game and then potentially the lack of like a defined usage there? It's hard to say, right? Because um, we just, we still don't know what the offense, like what the finished product is supposed to look like. You know, is this an offense that I don't think it's going to be? I mean, I know the enemy is a running back, but I don't think it's the offense is going to be a run to set up the pass offense. I think it's going to be a quick passing to set up the run offense. So I think, you know, if the screen game and the quick passing game is working, the run game is going to work a lot better. And, um, you know, hopefully he has more than, you know, one running play like Scott Turner did last year, where, you know, he just stands in a shotgun and hands it to Antonio Gibson and tells him to run left or right. Um, you know, if we, you know, that's an upgrade. If we, if we have more than one running, you know, more, more, more than one running play, uh, this year, but I do think, you know, the enemy being a running back, I think that the game still, the running game still matters to Eric, the enemy. I just don't know how, I don't know that it's going to be the primary focus of this offense. I do think the offense is going to be built around just the quick passing game 
and uh, getting the ball out of Sam's hands quickly. The running backs will definitely be there to bail him out. It's definitely not a run on first, run on second, pass on third offense. We're not going to see that. I'm interested to see how he uses Brian Robinson in the running game um, as a power as a power runner. Uh, is he going to have that? Uh, was it Pacheco role last year? Who was mm-hmm. just kind of the 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 hammer? Um, or is he going to you know try to utilize him on on the swing game? We've heard some things in the in the early. Uh, parts of training camp about, you know, Robinson's catching ability improving or, or being much better. Uh, so we that remains to be seen whether the running back is a concern. I know Ellie's the big running back fan on this on this podcast anyway. So you know, uh, Brian and I certainly don't uh, put a focus on the run game. It's nice to have. It's definitely something you need to be able to do at certain points in the game. But the game has evolved to the point where the running game is set up by the passing game, and I think that's going that's going to continue. Any thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah, I'm very intrigued with the running game this season. Um, Let's talk about Antonio Gibson for a second. Rookie season, had a decent season. Second season, finished top six in the NFL in rushing. Third season, he kind of disappeared. Who is the real Antonio Gibson? I think we get a strong answer this season. Because if he can't produce an offense like this, and, and granted, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any of it, honestly. But based on what reports have been coming out of camp, he should have a lot of opportunities to make explosive plays. That's what he did at Memphis. That's what he did his first two years in the NFL. Um, and kind of last season, but not as much. So, yeah, contract year, everything is lining up for Gibson to have a good season. So with him... Um, being motivated, and then he said he in the best shape of his life. You got Robinson, who's this playing, like you said, this, this playing, catching the ball out the backfield. Um, you know he's a hard runner. So I like those two as a duo. But I want to ask you, you, who do you think that third running back's going to be? Is it going to be Patterson um, or Rodriguez or somehow Jonathan Williams sneak his way to the third spot? Well, this is a very pro Jonathan Williams podcast, so I'm hoping Jay Will makes the cut. Uh, Rodriguez, I haven't heard a peep out of that guy. Has he made? A, has anybody mentioned him at all, other than how big he is? Right, <laughs> like if, especially in the during training season. camp. Yeah, I mean, it's we'll see. I think you know, there's definitely you know they did re-sign Williams to a uh, to an extension, so I think there's a good chance that he sticks around, even as a practice squad player. Um, but, you know, or they he's definitely on their short list of callbacks. I don't know if Rodriguez, I guess the preseason games will really tell us who that third running back is going to be. Um, you know, for selfishly, we all I know you're a you're a you're a Jay Will guy, too. But selfishly, we, we, we want Jay Will to be here. He's been a guest on our show before. He's a good dude. Um, and I hope he sticks around. And so far, based on what I've heard out of the other running backs in camp, I don't see any reason why he doesn't. Jarrett Patterson, you know. It's a great story, and I think he's probably another – this is a, a practice squad midseason call-up guy as well. Um, I just think, you know, you he's not a – you can – he's always that guy that's going to be – you're trying to replace for his entire career, and it's going to be up to him right. to stick around. You know, he's – you know, it's not his fault that they can't – they couldn't find a better running back than him, but if he's somebody that you got to rely on um, – who knows? You know, it's just not it's not a good thing. So I hope he sticks around. I hope he's a practice squad player. He's always been able to, you know, s- step up when he needed to. Uh, he makes a player to every season, but he's definitely not a guy. He's always going to be a guy that you're trying to replace. Uh, he's a bottom of the roster type running back. You need those guys on your team because they're inexpensive. You can't have everybody making, you know, seven, eight, nine figures. Um, right. So. You know he's a guy that you that you want, but I think you can you can always upgrade. And I think Jonathan Williams is is better than Jarrett Patterson anyway. Uh, and you know Chris Rodriguez remains to be seen. Speaking of uh, bottom of the roster, my internet is bottom of the roster. But you know what? We will uh, persevere here. Hey, um, defense and how special they can be. A lot has been made this offseason about how special the defense is, partially because of how the offense has looked in camp. Mike, are you subscribing to the fact that this is going to be a top five defense in the NFL? Yes, I guess. But there's the hesitant and um, the hesitancy in my voice is it's a year to year league. Like we finished third last season. 
what's the odds that a defense finished um, top five in back to back years? It's not, it doesn't happen a lot. So they might drop outside the top five, I mean, like eight or nine. Or, you know, they step up and be number one. But all I care about is can they perform on third downs? Can they perform in the red zone? Can they create turnovers? If they can do those three things, I don't care if they finish middle of the pack. You give your team the, the ball back by stopping them on third downs and creating turnovers. It, it's going to be a good year for your defense and your offense. But as far as top five, I'm going to say yes because I think the talent is there. I think um, the coaching is there with Del Rio. So they could be top five, but if they're not, I'm not going to cry about it. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah you know, the, a statistically good defense is not necessarily a good defense. There's a there's a difference between statistically good and good. And I always I always think back to like back in the mid two thousands, those Greg Blatch defenses that he was always like, well, we got a top five defense, like, but you can't get off the field on third down, like you were saying. Like, is it's great, but you don't create turnovers and you can't get off the field on third down. So okay, you you know give up two hundred and fifty yards a game. You know, when it matters, you can't get off the field. And that's the difference between a statistically good and a good defense. I would like to see, like you were saying, more than happy to be uh, number 12 defense, but like number four on third down and like, you know, number four in, you know, turn, you know, takeaway, you know, plus minus. Like if we can do that, that's, I mean, I'll take that over a number one defense any day because if you're just, you know, holding guys, holding teams to low yardage, but, they're scoring on you still and you're not taking the ball away. It's not as much help. I would much rather have an opportunistic defense that maybe gives up some yards here and there, but can stop teams in the red zone and can get off the field on third down. So you're hundred percent right on that. That's actually what I was going to interrupt you to say. So I'm glad you said it before, I, before I could do that. Um, it's, yeah, I'm um, not. It's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. It's two defenses that Washington has since I've been watching that I like, like really like. I'll start with the 05 defense led by Greg Double G Williams. Um, one of my favorite defenses of all time, not just Washington, but period, with um Philip Daniels, Cornelius Griffin, LeVar Arrington was on the team, Lamar Marshall was um on the team, my man Marcus that's, Washington, that's yeah, um uh, was on that team. Of course, the secondary was lit with Sean Taylor, Walt Hurst, um, Sean Springs. Ryan, no, I think Ryan Clark left. No, that was yeah, his Clark. last year. It was his last year. No, was was it? Yeah, yeah, that was his last year. Yeah, that was Clark's mm -hmm. last season. So I love that defense. And what they brought was intensity. Like, I, I loved how they just ran to the ball. Like, whoever was running it, you'll see about three, four red skins on that 2005 defense. Um, I like that defense for their aggression. But the defense that people sleep on a lot. Is the 2012 defense? They didn't rank high, but what they did exactly what they needed to do that year. They forced yeah. turnovers. I wish I could remember where they ranked, but I know like every time the defense needed to get a turnover, they got a turnover, and that, that's why that 2012 team was so fun to watch. I know RG3 was doing this thing on offense, and Alpha Morris was doing this thing on offense. But just think about all the turnovers from that year, if you can. How did we win the division? I mean, how did we make it to the playoffs that season? The end of the season, week 17, Tony Romo threw an interception. The defense caused the turnover. And the um, Redskins won the division. So, yeah, that's why I'm not tripping up as, um, as much with total yards. Give me a top 10 turnover team. Stay number five or top five and third down conversions. And we'll be all right. Score some touchdowns on thing, defense. That's a must. That's a must. And the one thing I think we, we cannot take for granted is how much the defensive statistics last year benefited because of ball control offense. When you're not on the field that much, you are statistically going to be better. Uh, and I think that's a, a nuance that we can't forget if we see that the defense isn't top five. It's not that they got a whole lot worse. It's that they're on the field more because our offense is better. So, um, Folks, you keep that in mind. Let's wrap it up with this preseason playing time. The preseason is finally upon us. Eric, give me the key offensive uh, players, uh, Sam Howe, um, Terry McLaurin, 
um, who I don't even know else. What, what kind of playing time do you want to see from the off the starting offense here? I would like to see the offensive line and Sam Howell play a quarter in the first game. I think they need at least a quarter. Uh, they need that work. Howell is a brand new quarterback, and I know generally in the first preseason game you don't play your starter starters that long. Howell needs the work, and I think you know Howell. And you know if you look at your backup receivers, you got Deami Brown in there, Cole Turner. Um, so there are guys there that he can play with and make plays with, uh, even with the second team. But I would keep that first team offensive line because again, that's a unit that has been struggling and needs the cohesion. Um, so I'm, if I'm keeping Howell in there, I'm keeping those that starting O line in there. I would like to see that. Uh, other than that, I don't want to see Curtis Samuel. I don't want to see Logan Thomas. Uh, they're already broken. I don't, we don't need that. Uh, Terry McLaurin, he's going to do his thing. Jahan Dotson's going to do his thing. Maybe do, get Dotson a little bit, a little bit of run in there just because he's young. But those guys are. I'm not worried about those guys. I'm worried about that offensive line, and I'm worried about the quarterback position. Um, you know, run Jonathan Williams and Chris Rodriguez with it with that group. But just you know, get the quarterback and the offensive line some run. That's what I'm. That's what I'd like to see in the offense, at least a quarter in the first game, uh, and maybe a little bit more in that second game, and even a little bit into that third game. Those guys really need to work together. Yeah, I think Chris Rodriguez is going to be the preseason darling around here, just because he's going to be plowing over smaller dudes, and people are going to fall in love with that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm with you, Eric. I want to see a lot of Howell the first quarter. Um, I also want to see a lot of Brissette, and uh, I want to see Diami Brown to see if his offseason improvement is really real. Right? He has he has had issues holding on to the ball, including in the preseason last year. Let's see if his hands got better. I've been slow-mo watching some of his catches in preseason. Still a little shaky. That ball moves around a lot when it hits his hands, but um, – Hopefully he can uh, prove us different. I am, wrong I am not a believer team. anymore in Deami Brown. I have he's lost me. It's okay. I he's think he is what he is at this point. He might prove me wrong. Go for it if you do, but I think he is what he is at this point. You might be right. Um, Mike, defensively, Chase Young, Montez Sweat, those guys, um, Cam Curl, Derek Forrest. How much of those those guys do you want to see? And how much do you want to see of the rookie Forbes and uh Martin and uh, uh preseason? Very little. And the only reason I say that is because I know what's happening next week. I know we're hitting the Baltimore, the practice against the Ravens. I don't need I I don't need to see them against the Browns in the preseason game. I'm talking about the starters, both on offense and defense. If they play if, if they play a series of piece, I'm cool with that. Because traditionally speaking, especially recently. You learn more about your team and these team these um squad versus squad practices. I saw a clip earlier today with um Tyreek Hill just giving it to a um Falcons quarterback and one on ones. I want to see Forbes versus Odell one on one. I want to see um St. Juice versus um what's the Ravens receiver the rookie I can't remember his name Zay Flowers. I want to see Zay Flowers versus St. Juice one on one. I don't need to see this in the preseason. We already know what's going to happen. They're going to play a little bit. They'll probably look okay, a little shaky, and then they're going to sit down. Nah, save that energy for next week versus Baltimore. Yeah. How many I mean, uh, so over, over on Ron Brawls next week? Who's, who starts the fight? Oh, oh it's good. going down. At least, at least two fights. Nothing They're big fighting. like – Nothing big Angelo like – with DeAndre happened. back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Nah, um, the Texans, nothing big like that is going to happen. Like, I don't see a full team brawl only because of the, re- the mutual respect between coaches. Rivera, um, Harbaugh, they go back. They go way back, like 30 years with each other. So I don't, I don't necessarily foresee that. But I do, I do think um, Marlon Humphrey and McLaurin is going to, get face to face a couple of times next week. And I think it'll just be strong competition for both teams. And then next Monday night, we play a little bit more and, you know, hopefully make each other better. And who knows? Maybe we'll finally get that Beltway Super Bowl. You never know. You never know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. You know, Baltimore's got that that preseason.